Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Nuclear Criticality Safety Lecture Series. Today we're going to begin shifting the focus of these lectures towards code validation, which will involve understanding the sources of uncertainty in our criticality safety simulations, and how this uncertainty affects our criticality safety evaluations. We'll begin this process today by discussing nuclear data. Nuclear data is an essential but often overlooked aspect of nuclear engineering, modeling, and simulation. It's tempting to assume that our nuclear data is perfect and that our codes are black boxes that produce perfect answers with no uncertainty. Although the nuclear data community is full of dedicated, highly intelligent scientists and engineers, the data itself is certainly not perfect. So what does nuclear data describe, and how is it measured, and how is it verified? When we discuss nuclear data, we generally mean neutron cross-sections, which describe the probability that neutrons will undergo some interaction with a nucleus over some distance. Nuclear data can also describe interaction probabilities for particles other than neutrons, such as photons or electrons, or the half-lives of radioactive nuclei, or what isotopes a nucleus will produce after it undergoes fission, but for the purpose of nuclear criticality safety, nuclear data usually means neutron cross-sections. In general, nuclear data tends to follow this general structure. There are four general regions for cross-sections as a function of the incoming energy of a neutron. At low energies, cross-sections tend to follow a 1 over v distribution, where v is the velocity of the neutron interacting with a nucleus. As this neutron's energy increases, it reaches the point where it can excite nucleons into different nuclear shells. Just like there are different valence levels for electrons around atoms, it's possible to excite nucleons into different energy levels within the nucleus. Just like the k-edge effects that we see for photons interacting with electron valence levels, we see dramatic spikes in the probability that a neutron will interact with a nucleus when that neutron's energy corresponds to the transition energy for the nucleus's excited states. These spikes are known as resonances. A nucleus that has a significant number of nucleons, such as uranium-235, has a lot of different ways that these nucleons can get excited, which means that these heavy nuclei have an enormous number of neutron resonances. Reactor physics, and as it turns out, reactor safety, reactor stability, and reactor dynamics, all depend on these resonances to provide negative reactivity, which again happens because Doppler broadening causes these resonances to absorb more neutrons as a material's temperature increases. Because of this, nuclear data scientists and physicists spend a great deal of effort understanding the behavior and location of these resonances. But at some energy, these resonances are so plentiful that we cannot measure or identify individual resonances. This somewhat chaotic point where we can no longer resolve individual resonances is known as the unresolved resonance region. At this point, nuclear data physicists will actually randomly sample whether a particle is at an energy corresponding to the location of an unresolved resonances. At some point after this, there are so many resonances that we no longer need to randomly sample them, and the cross-sections can be assumed to be smooth functions of energy. This region is known as the fast or high energy region. Some physicists disagree that this is the high energy region because they feel that high energy involves particles with GeV of energy. But most fission systems nuclear engineers consider the MeV range to be high energy. So that's what nuclear data looks like, but how do we actually obtain it? It turns out that getting nuclear data involves a combination of theory and nuclear data measurement. Nuclear data evaluations are nuclear data scientists' best estimate of what the nuclear data actually is, and these evaluations are what we use for our criticality simulations. Generating a nuclear data evaluation involves solving the Schrodinger equation for various channels of interaction, where a channel describes how a pair of incoming and outgoing particles might interact as a function of their mass, charge, and spin quantum numbers. These channels of interaction are described by the R matrix, which is a matrix of eigenfunctions for the energy levels of the compound nucleus as these particles interact. In practice, we cannot solve for the R matrix directly, and instead we solve for a simplified form of the R matrix, such as the A matrix or the U matrix. 
Nuclear data formalisms are different approaches for simplifying and solving this R matrix. The single-level Bright-Wigner formalism assumes that there is no interaction or overlap between resonances, and it is one of the most simplified forms of the R matrix. Because of its approximations, the single-level Bright-Wigner formalism produces crude and sometimes negative cross-section estimates. Single-level Bright-Wigner might be okay for unimportant materials or for nuclides for which we have limited data, but in practice, it should be avoided. The multi-level Bright-Wigner formalism improves on single-level Bright-Wigner, and it zeroes most of the off-diagonal terms in the energy-level matrix. However, the rich Mohr formalism is even more accurate, and it is generally the method of choice for nuclear data evaluations. Alternatively, the Adler-Adler formalism provides another alternative option, as does the multipole formalism. The multipole formalism has become more popular in recent years due to the shift towards massively parallel GPU-based computing. The rich Mohr formalism requires about several gigabytes of storage for nuclear data during simulations, which can be problematic for simulations involving GPUs, which typically have a small amount of available RAM per processor. The multipole formalism requires storing significantly less data, but it requires much more computing power since it computes cross-sections on the fly. This on-the-fly cross-section computation is ideal for GPU-based simulations, which generally have a lot of flops to spare, and it is also ideal for systems that have significant temperature variations, since the multiple formalism can Doppler broaden cross-sections on the fly when it computes them. The rich Mohr approach for storing cross-sections produces a linear increase in the memory footprint as the number of temperatures for the cross-sections increases. So rich Mohr is the method of choice now, but we'll have to see if the multipole formalism overtakes it in the future. So how do we get the nuclear data, and how do nuclear data scientists put it into these formalisms? Generating nuclear data generally involves fitting rich Mohr model parameters, such as resonance energies and widths, to nuclear data measurements. Each one of these nuclear data fits is called a nuclear data evaluation. The measurements that we fit these parameters to are known as differential nuclear data. This data is differential because it is measured over very small changes in energy, with the goal of each energy point being measured as close to a delta energy as possible. This differential data is obtained using very finely tuned time-of-flight neutron or ion beams. These beams have sensitive detectors that measure neutron interactions as a function of time, and allow particles to travel a long distance between where they are created and where they interact with the sample. If you know when these particles are created, and how far they travel before colliding with the sample, and precisely when they interact with the sample, then you should be able to convert the time-dependent particle interaction rates into energy-dependent reaction rates, which we then use to estimate the nuclear cross-sections. There aren't many facilities that are capable of performing differential data measurements. The Orella facility at Oak Ridge National Laboratory performed differential measurements for years, but it has since been closed down. The Galena facility in Giel, Belgium, is currently the main facility for differential data measurements, although in more recent years, the RPI Linux has also been performing some really nice differential data measurements. These differential data measurements aren't performed that frequently due to the limited number of differential data facilities, the large number of isotopes, and the high degree of fidelity required for these measurements. In fact, most new nuclear data evaluations are for the most part just better fits to old differential data. Differential data measurements are, as you can see here, usually fairly noisy, and evaluating this nuclear data involves using Bayesian statistical methods to optimally fit model parameters to this noisy data. The SAMI code from Oak Ridge is used in the majority, about 80%, of these nuclear data evaluations, while the Conrad code from CEA and the refit code from England and Giel are used to a lesser extent. There are quite a few different libraries of evaluated nuclear data, and most of the major players in the nuclear engineering community maintain their own library of nuclear data. These multiple libraries don't exist solely due to competition or because of hesitancy to share differential data, they exist because of redundancy and safety. If each nuclear data library is developed and maintained independently, then a rare error in one library is unlikely to appear in a different library, 
And so, if we're worried that the uncertainty in nuclear data might cause our subcritical system to actually be supercritical, or if we suspect that our uranium-235 fission cross-sections are somehow off by a factor of two, then we can use a different library to simulate our system as a sanity check. The NFB library, currently on version 8, is maintained out of Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York. The Gendel library is maintained by the Japan Atomic Energy Agency. The Joint Evaluated Fission and Fusion Library is maintained by European nations and is headquartered in the Nuclear Energy Agency in Paris. The Sendel Library is maintained by China, and the Russ Fond Library is maintained by Russia. So now that we've performed differential data measurements, fit our rich more model parameters to this data, and developed a nuclear data evaluation, how do we know if this evaluation is correct? The answer is to perform integral benchmark measurements. While differential data attempts to divide measurements into as close to a delta energy as possible, integral measurements do the opposite. They build real-life fissile material experiments and measure certain observable quantities, such as the system's eigenvalue, reaction rates, fluxes, the worth of different reactivity insertions, or ratios of reaction rates. These observables are often system-wide parameters that are integrated over energy and sometimes over large regions of space, which is why they are called integral measurements. Once we have performed these integral experiment measurements, we can model these systems in our favorite modeling and simulation code and check whether these simulated responses match the measured benchmark response values. If our computational model does a good job of modeling the experiment's geometry, and if we use a method that doesn't really introduce any approximations, such as a continuous energy Monte Carlo simulation, then really the only reason why our code would disagree with the experiment's result is if there's an error in the nuclear data. If things match up well, then our data is likely very good. The international criticality safety community spends a good deal of time and effort performing and documenting integral benchmark experiments. These experiments are documented or evaluated in libraries such as the International Criticality Safety Benchmark Experiment Project, the ICSBEP, or the International Handbook of Reactor Physics Experiments, or the Shielding Integral Benchmark Archive and Database, or in the Spent Fuel Isotopic Composition Database. In theory, these integral benchmark experiments should only be used to confirm the accuracy of nuclear data evaluations, but in practice, there is some inbreeding. Nuclear data scientists often want to guarantee that certain golden standard benchmarks, such as Godiva or Jezebel, produce an eigenvalue that is exactly 1.0, and sometimes they adjust their nuclear data evaluations until they reach nearly exact agreement for these gold standard benchmarks. This introduces a correlation between the nuclear data evaluation and the integral benchmark evaluation, which tends to overestimate the amount of uncertainty present in the nuclear data evaluation. Documenting and resolving this untreated correlation is the subject of ongoing research and is the goal of an international expert group of nuclear scientists. We'll close our discussion today by addressing the question of how good is our data? The cross-section covariance matrix describes the amount of uncertainty present in nuclear data evaluations. This uncertainty comes in the form of a matrix because certain uncertainties are correlated. For example, using a uranium-235 source to calibrate a detector measuring plutonium-239 fission cross-sections would correlate these cross-section measurements. Alternatively, some cross-sections might be correlated because it's difficult to know exactly what kind of reaction happened. For example, at higher energies, it's not always clear if a neutron that emerges from a scattering collision scattered elastically or inelastically. Once we have this correlated cross-section covariance data, we can feed it into something called the sandwich equation to propagate the impact of cross-section uncertainty and to estimate its impact on integral experiment responses, which are represented by R in this equation. Propagating this uncertainty requires knowledge of the sensitivity coefficients for this integral experiment. These sensitivities, which are essentially just relative derivatives, describe how uncertainty or perturbations to some cross-section, as a function of energy, will impact that system's response R. We'll discuss sensitivity coefficients in much more detail later in this course.
Methods for computing these sensitivity coefficients are relatively new, and they were developed in their most accurate form, which is for continuous energy Monte Carlo codes, for the first time in 2009, when doctors Brian Kadrowski and Forrest Brown implemented the iterated fission probability method in MCMP. Before this, in 1999, Dr. Brad Reardon developed the tsunami sensitivity analysis method in the multigroup Kino code, which actually kicked off much of the sensitivity and uncertainty analysis work in the nuclear criticality safety community. Drs. Reardon and Perfetti, which is me, also extended the tsunami methodology to continuous energy calculations in 2012, and the field has been growing rapidly ever since. The cross-section covariance data used to be fairly poorly quantified, and the emergence of these sensitivity methods, led primarily by Oak Ridge, spurred the development of more accurate covariance data, to the point where nuclear resonance parameter covariances are now distributed with NDEF releases. So getting down to brass tacks, how much uncertainty is there in the eigenvalue estimates from high-fidelity simulations? In general, uncertainty in nuclear data introduces an approximately 1% uncertainty in the eigenvalue for fast systems, a 0.5% uncertainty in the eigenvalue for thermal spectrum systems, and a roughly 1.5% uncertainty in the eigenvalue for intermediate spectrum systems. However, this is only the uncertainty in the eigenvalue estimate, which nuclear data have been optimized around, and it's possible that there's much more uncertainty in other, less scrutinized quantities, such as local reaction rates or eigenvalues for exotic reactor designs. Studies by Boge and Reardon have shown that you can change the eigenvalue for Godiva, a golden standard benchmark experiment, by roughly 500 PCM, or 0.5%, just by swapping out nuclear data from different libraries. There's also a roughly 700 PCM swing in HTGR simulation eigenvalues due to uncertainty in U-235 and U-238 cross-sections, and Reardon and Perfetti have absorbed a more than 3,000 PCM swing in the eigenvalue of chloride-based molten salt reactor concepts due to errors in the chlorine-35 NP cross-section. Nuclear data is in a pretty good state right now, but we will always have more room to improve our nuclear data. This concludes our brief introduction to the world of nuclear data. In the coming lectures, we will begin discussing methods to estimate the upper subcritical limit of systems containing fissile material.